here. Hi, Dr. Shubin. Hi, Dr. Shubin. So you can't, you're muted right now. Yeah, Thanks. I'm so used to Zoom, I'm not used to Meets. Good afternoon, how you doing? Great, how are you? Well, thanks. Everybody okay? Yes, doing great. Thank you very much for showing up. Well, my pleasure, of course. Hi, Miriam. All right. Well, to be respectful of everybody's time, since it's like one o'clock, um, let me go ahead and can everybody mute themselves, please? So, um, Dr. Shubin, some of the students were able to log in to your uh, talk at Harvard, also. Oh, awesome! Go ahead, great. So, so that was that was pretty neat. Um, thank you very, very much for joining us. Um, I am just really honored to have you. I know it's really exciting uh, for my students and for those who are like working right now or can't hop on. They're going to watch the recording, so that's really exciting, also. We just finished the um, evolution unit and we're going into ecology. So it's kind of just a really great wrap up um, kind of a, of the unit and uh, looking into, into what we're going forward. Um, so I have a list of questions um, from, from the students, from some staff members. We do have some staff members on. Um, and the first question, is about your time in the Arctic. You spent, what, six years studying in there. What was the most unexpected part of spending six years studying in the Arctic? <laughs> well, you learn a lot about yourself. I'll put it that way. So we um, we worked there for six years, but to find Tiktaalik. So it took us six years to find the fossil, but we worked there for another seven after finding it. So we worked there for 13 because we found more. We found 20 of them because we went, after we found it, we went to get more. And I brought I brought a little friend. This is TikTok Rosie. I don't know if they've seen the, this is the cast of the skull. Anyway, so yeah, when we go up there, we work in a small team of about six or seven people, uh, sometimes eight. Um, each of our own tents, we have a kitchen tent. The weather can be really great. It could be really terrible. It's usually around, in the Arctic, it's around oh, it's about 20 degrees to 30 to freezing, somewhere in there in the summer. It's daylight 24 hours a day. That's surprising. There are polar bears up there. That's not too surprising, but that's what, that's what it is. Um, some of the surprising things are, you know, it's such, it's, you feel so privileged to work there because in many places, this is not, nobody else has camped in these sites. Nobody else has walked these sites. You're oftentimes the first person to visit these areas ever, you know, yeah. and that feels really special. You can drink the water right out of the melting glaciers. I mean, I don't carry a water bottle. I carry a mug. It's pure. It's the purest water on the planet. So you're just like, that's surprisingly beautiful, right? You can just take a mug and just drink the water from the streams. Um, it can be incredibly peaceful there. You know, on a good day, it can get up to say 40 degrees and just quiet and, and just gorgeous. You have the whole place to yourself, no people, no internet, you know, no cell coverage, no wireless. I mean, imagine that, you're just cut off from everything for six weeks. Um, that, you know, in today's world, that's kind of surprising, right? To be just removed from the grid so thoroughly. Um, it does amazing things to your brain, to be quite honest, because you get used to it in a really nice way. Everything becomes quieter. You, you realize all the focus you lose living as we do, tied to our electronics. Imagine living six months with no cell, no wireless, just the five other people with you, you know? Um, Social yeah, isolation on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> it is social isolation on steroids. So, you know, to some extent, you know, I was talking to folks about it. They say, How, what have you learned? I said, I've learned what I'm going through now is not as hard as when I go to an intent like up there. Um, one thing, so, you know, so it gets challenging. So to answer the question in a little more detail, it's not always fun because you can get bad weather that persists for about a week or two and you're getting stuck in your tents. And people can get, you know, if you're not finding fossils, if you're, it's in bad weather, you're, isolated and removed, it can get tough. So there are a couple tricks I have for keeping things uh, normal. And one of them, you're gonna laugh. Yeah, I know you're gonna all laugh, but it's really true. Take great food. If you take great food, in particular candy, chocolates, sweets, licorices, anything people like, just find out what people like, it really will change attitudes. It's amazing, it's really true. So you know, if, if one of you was to come on my one of my expeditions, I'd say, what do you, what's your favorite dinner? What's your favorite breakfast? What's your favorite lunch? What's your favorite candy? What's your favorite dessert? And I will make sure I have it in, in spades so that if at the end of a long day, you have something really fun to look forward to, you know? And one of the other side benefits, I work in Antarctica now, one of the side benefits is you burn like 6,000 calories a day. 
So, you know, that translates into about five chocolate bars that, you know, I'll still lose weight if I, you know, three Toblerones and, you know, two bags of you know, Twizzlers, you know, so uh, <laughs> I'm not proud. I'll eat a lot. It's really fun. That's the, you know, so when, when the tough gets, when it gets going really tough, uh, the food really helps. That surprises most people, but it probably shouldn't. One of, uh, you had mentioned Tiktaalik and you showed us his uh, cast just now. One of my students wanted to know, um, since you said that that's an Inuit yes. name, what does it mean in English or is there a Yeah, there is, it means it's basically their word for a large freshwater fish. So they, you know, they hunt the Inuit and they hunt in the ocean, but they also hunt on these sort of ephemeral streams that the glaciers melt, sometimes salmon come up. And there are fish that they can catch in the streams in the Western part of the Arctic and they call them Tiktaaliks. And so that's, uh, that's when we talked to the Inuit elders, we, uh, we wanted a name from their language and that was the name they came up with. And that was also the name we could pronounce. Their, their language is actually challenging to pronounce. And so we, uh, that, was, that was the winner of the competition. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, another student asked, what is a, a you know, paleontologist and, and how do you become one? Okay. Um, so is paleontology, I, when I um, went to school, I, as a grad, so when I went to undergrad, um, I took an evolution course in my first year at, at college. And it was taught by a curator at my local natural history museum. And he brought all these casts of skulls and things like that. And I was like, oh, I like this. This is really fun. So um, when the course was done, I volunteered at the museum. So that's the first thing I ever did. That's the, and what I would recommend is volunteer at a local museum or at a local laboratory with you know, whatever you're interested in. It helps to get out of the classroom. Use your classroom experience, because that's incredibly important. But then work with, uh, you know, work in a museum. They love to have high school and college students. And that was so important to me because working in the museum, I got to talk to other scientists. I got to see what it was like being a scientist. You know, I had no idea. Nobody in my family was a scientist. So it was my first exposure to that. Um, and then in, I got invited on a field expedition in my sophomore year of college. And uh, that was, yeah, I got invited to go to Wyoming. You know, they were looking for dinosaurs and mammals and the Cretaceous rocks and a ranch in uh, Southeastern Wyoming. I'm like, yeah, I, I was terrible, okay? It's, it's not where you start, it's where you end. I broke more fossils than I found that first year. But I knew I liked it, and I knew if I stuck with it, I'd get okay, and I've gotten okay. So, But you know, I didn't start off okay at all. I was pretty far from okay when I started. <laughs> Persistence that pays off in the and end. It's true, it's true for every field. You gotta stick with it. Yeah, in your, um, in your talk in Harvard and in your new book, you talk about, um, a lot of genes aren't new, but rather they are old genes that are repurposed. Um, what's your favorite example of this repurposing of genes? Yeah, so uh, you know, a great example of, of, of gene repurposing are the Hox genes, the genes that are involved in originally in specifying in, in development of the vertebral or the axle, the vertebral column. They've been recruited to make to pattern genitalia, uh, limbs appendages, um, portions of the brain. So what started as a, a, gene, a set of genes that were involved in patterning sort of the back area, the backbone area, were then later recruited to form other things like external genitalia, appendages, both paired and unpaired, as well as portions of the hindbrain. So it's like a little, a tool that's been redeployed in multiple, and co-opted in multiple places. Um, another one is this gene sonic hedgehog, which is, uh, you know, which is involved in appendage development. It's involved in any structure in the body that needs to tell the difference from one side to another that has polarity. Say like difference between thumb and pinky. Well, there are lots of parts of our body that have this left right patterning that needs to happen. And sonic is also often pulled into that as well. So these genes are like nails. They're pulled out whenever they're needed and used. So it arises in one context and then it's used in others you know, during evolution. So. Oh, wow, that is really, really cool. Um, how does the study of evolution impact other fields? Yeah, well, in a very big way. I mean, so for instance, uh, I'll give you one example. So the techniques we use with, to understand, we, we can, I can use DNA and I could sequence the DNA that we have and I can tell how closely related we are to one another, all of us. Yeah, it's easy. We do that all the time. Everybody's used to reading about that. You can go to 23andMe and see that. You can send you, you know, a swab yeah, sample. I, showed, I think I showed most of my classes, my 23andMe DNA spread. <laughs> yeah, um, so we can do that. 
but it gets even deeper because those same techniques we can use to refer our own history are the ones we're applying to understand how coronavirus changed and evolved, where it arose from, how it likely spread around the world. So those same techniques are used in epidemiology. The phylogenetic techniques we use to uncover evolutionary history are extremely valuable in tracing disease and how it spreads, for instance, and how it can jump between species. Um, you know, so there are lots of examples like that. There are other examples, for instance, we can use evolutionary history in some surprising ways. Okay, so if I lose a finger, let's say something happens, I lose a finger in the field, will it grow back? No, it won't grow back. However, salamanders, as many of you might know, if you cut a salamander limb off, it'll grow back entirely. Humerus, radius ulna, wrist, digits, muscles, bones, nerves, all of it. Turns out that salamanders aren't all that special. When we look at evolutionary history, we could see that fish fins regenerate as well. So when we look at evolution, it's not like salamanders gained the ability to regenerate their appendages. No, it's that most other animals have that ability and our branch of the tree of life lost it. So now we're asking the question, of what did we lose in evolution that stopped us from being able to regenerate like salamanders? Are there genes that we've lost? Are there proteins that they have? Are there cell types that they, we don't have? Because if we want to stimulate it in us, it's kind of good to know our, you know, our, our evolutionary cousins who have it. So there are all kinds of examples like that. So that's kind of what we do. Wow, uh, that would be coming really handy, I guess. Literally, it. yeah. <laughs> Literally, fingery, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> that's what we're going to try to do, Caleb. We're going to try to get it back. I don't know if we can, though. Uh, but, you know, because it's a lot of genes. So the preliminary analysis, just so you know, the people in my lab are doing it. It's probably about 200 genes that are the difference, you know. And so you'd have to introduce a whole network of genes into it. Could be done. We'll see. Um, what do you think would be the most impactful lessons or ideas that you think most uh, that are most important for high school biology students to understand? Well, I think it's about evolution in, in particular, how central it is to biology. That is, you can't really understand modern biology from genomics to anatomy to embryology without really knowing evolution, because that's what pulls it all together. The, um, but it's even more than that. If you look at the Nobel Prizes in medicine and physiology that have gone to people in the last, say, 40 years, who have they gone to? They've gone to people working on mice. They've gone to people working on flies. They've gone to people working on corn. In fact, two Nobel Prizes awarded to five people in the last 12 years have gone to folks working on Cinerabditis elegans, tiny little worm the size of a comma on a piece of paper. Yet that little worm is telling us about how our genes are turned off in health and disease, how they are programmed to naturally die, and what goes wrong in human cancers. So the basic breakthroughs that will extend and enrich our lives are originally based on flies, worms, in some cases even fish, as written by, as you can see in the Nobel Prizes to understand how those discoveries of these other feet done on these other creatures apply to us, we need to know evolution. How have we evolved that's different from fish, from worms, from flies? And that's what's critical because we can do experiments on those animals we can never do on people. You know, we would never manipulate human embryos in a way we could worms or, or flies. So we have more techniques that we can apply to understand their biology. But that tells us about our own biology once we know about evolution and how we're related to them. What's your work like? How much time is spent reading, writing, teaching, and, and how much time do you still go in the field? Yeah, so I think most of my time is spent in Chicago in the laboratory here. I run a laboratory of about 12 people. You know, so you get up in the morning, I have lab meetings. We do a lot of molecular biology on Hox genes in my lab, uh, meet with the people who are doing that. We have a CT scanner downstairs. So what we do is most of the fossils that we find, such as these, we've CT scanned. And um, you know we have them on digit, so we dig and digitally, so we work on the digital scans of the fossils quite a bit to understand and compare. So a lot of time is spent on analysis and writing. Field work is usually two months a year, usually not this year, obviously because of the COVID nineteen, but two months a year is the standard sort of thing. Um, Antarctica is two months. Antarctica is yeah, usually about six weeks, something like that. Um, writing, so like writing books, I'll do that on weekends, things like that. So yeah, no, but it's a balance. I'd say most of it is in meetings and working, talking about the analysis of scientific results. Next comes writing, writing papers and books, and next comes field work. Are you still teaching in the anatomy lab? 
No, I teach an undergraduate anatomy course. So freshmen who come to the University of Chicago, non-majors, I teach a course for them in the fall. It's on your inner fish, basically. Yeah. And um, our, I know that you just wrote um, and published a new book. No. Um, are you working on another one currently? Not, not yet. I'm taking a bit of a break. We're doing a lot of lab work right now. So as I said, one thing that's occupying a lot of my time and I'm not doing the school visits is we've scanned the Tiktaalik collection, the entire, we have 20 specimens of Tiktaalik. So we scanned all of them. And so we have all these data and don't tell anybody, but uh, we found a new Tiktaalik, a new kind of Tiktaalik, not, not, not the original, it's a different genus, so probably a different name in one of the blocks. And so it came out in a scan. So we're really excited. It's, you know, so we're, in fact, later today, I'm going to meet with some of the graduate students about that. Um, and we're talking, you know, so we're trying to work it. We can work, we can't get it in the lab now because of the, obviously the, um, the school's closed, but, and be probably closed for another month or so. But once we're back there, we got to rescan everything in higher resolution. But right now we're trying to understand what we have based on the kind of the initial scans, the, the searching scans we did. exciting <laughs> are you so yeah, you're still working on the evolution from you know water to land what other big questions? yeah we're doing that so we we're working in antarctica we so our last two expeditions have been towards the south pole about 600 miles from the south pole in rocks that are similar to those that produce tiktaalik a little bit older um and we're working on those we collected a lot of fossils last year we were uh, there can i share a screen is there possible to oh no it's tough i can't Actually, no, Google Meets doesn't let me share. I'm on a Mac. It doesn't let me share my slides too wide because I'd have to show a, a PDF. Let me see if I have it. Ah, darn. If I could show you slides, I would, but I don't have a PDF of it. And Meet doesn't like you. No. It, it doesn't like Keynote. Yeah, no, it, um, it likes PDFs. And so let me see. No, nah, don't worry about it. Anyway, you can imagine Antarctica, very cold, very icy. <laughs> that's, where, that's where we're working now. Um, evolutionary biology has been informing medicine more and more. What are some examples where an evolutionary approach has helped us make medical progress beyond the colorblind monkey example from this series? Yeah, so it turns out one of the best models for human um, skin diseases like melanoma or blood diseases like um, lymphoma are turned out to be in uh, fish. So the zebrafish has turned out to be an excellent disease model for a lot of ways. First, it's very simple to, mo to modify. That is what you can do is you can do experiments on zebrafish you can't do on humans. There are systems that function very similar to humans. So for instance, it's pancreas uh, and insulin uh, producing system is, is very similar to humans. So the fundamentals of understanding type one diabetes, some of the breakthroughs there are actually initially based on fish. Um, likewise, some blood diseases, as I said, some cancers. If you do like zebrafish human disease model, just type that into a Google search. You'll just see a long list of things that people are using the zebrafish to understand. And the reason is because we, we're related to them. And so I'd say, yeah, metabolic diseases, uh, cancers, uh, blood diseases, mitochondrial disorders, uh, you know, fish are really good models. So those are the, some of those same fish that you just have in your tanks, like normal aquariums. Yeah, right? zebra, yeah, zebra, yeah, there's one fish in particular called the zebrafish, which is, you know, most scientists who work on fish are working with zebrafish because we have the genome. We have a lot of tools and resources that labs can share on it. You know, so it's a small little fish called Danio Ririo, and it's um, it's a great lab model. Okay. So, if you want to become a paleontologist, what should the students study outside of high school? Um, yeah. So. Right. Good question. You definitely get a good training in biology and geology. So in biology, you want to know anatomy and the diversity of life. There are lots of courses on those. Helps to know ecology. No geology. You got to know a lot about rocks. You got to know a bit about, you know, because you got to know where to find, if you want to know where to find fossils and what fossils mean, you got to learn the rocks. And so there are two tracks for people to become a paleontologist. Either they study geology and go in it that way, or they study biology and go in it that way. But in either case, they need both geology and biology. But that being said, the best thing you can do to, you know, when you are a young person exploring science as a potential for a career, the, no matter what science it is, whether it's astronomy or medical health professions or paleontology or what have you, is to volunteer, to work with somebody, whether it's a physician, whether it's a field ecologist, whether it's a paleontologist in a museum, you know, and you have so many resources at your fingertips online, 
you can find people and reach out to them. Don't be shy. I wasn't shy when I was young. And, you know, when I was, I was always happy to ask people, Hey, can I volunteer in your lab? They're like, yeah, uh, sure. You know, and uh, I, you know, so, and I wasn't a very remarkable student. So that's the other thing. I wasn't like, I was, you know, I was, I was a good student, but I wasn't like the best student in the entire school student. And uh, no, it didn't make a difference. What mattered was really volunteering, working hard and knowing I, I wasn't really good when I started, but, you know, sticking with it a bit. Um, when creating the Urine or Fish series, was your main goal to provide like scientific fact and reasoning to educate the general public on evolution, or was it to persuade and inform those who were, who were either opposed or intimidated by evolution? A little bit of both. I mean, I think we really wanted to tell the stories of discovery. Our, that was our motivation. Our motivation was to show not just what we know, but how we know it and how do people make discovery. Because we thought that's the best way to, you know, engage a general audience. I mean, I could, look, I could have done the whole show about the anatomy of TikTok. I would have loved it. You would have hated it because it's just like anatomy. But the, the, the key thing, though, is that when you, once you tell the discovery story, how we knew where to look, how we stuck to it, it becomes much more understandable because stories are very powerful. So, you know, we, we realize that it's the, you know, it's the power of storytelling because it helps us as a species, as people, remember things we remember in the stuff in the context of stories we would never remember the same way otherwise just think of a movie you've seen and how all those little facts you saw over two hours you can remember most of them because they're part of a story if i was just to sprinkle those facts out at you you'd never remember that you know this guy darth vader was wearing black you know but you know it in the context of a story you can tell you know so anyway it's stories but you can do math i mean caleb no math can be you know, read books by Stephen Strogatz. He tells the stories of how scientists uncovered, um, you know, theorems and so forth. It's a different way of knowing. They're not traveling to the North Pole or anything like that. But there are discovery stories in math, which are interesting. Um, but yeah, but I mean, yeah, again, I mean, if it is different. It's easier for me to tell stories, um, you know, uh, in paleontology than it is for a mathematician, obviously, to tell stories about a theorem. But um but that was our goal with the series. And so as a consequence, we wanted to get the word out on the inner fish. We weren't as interested in anti-evolution people because you're not always going to change. It's hard to change minds, you know? I mean, I, you know, you spend a lot of effort trying to change people's minds and you're not going to, some people have very deeply held views. Um, mine, ours was just to kindle interest. The key thing was, it's not to change minds, but to kindle interest in students and the general public and in something that they may not have realized they, they would have liked, like, hey, Finding fossil fish is kind of cool, right? If you get somebody to say that, you've been successful, so. <laughs> what, what did you think about um, going and seeing the, uh, like, arty and stuff in the, in the oh. artifacts and stuff? In yeah, the that was one of the high points, yeah. Oh, golly, you know, I mean, one of the fringe benefits of doing the series was getting to go to the Lucy site. Yeah. When I was, you know, when I was your student's age, I would, you know, I was studying about the discovery of Lucy in my class. And then, you know, here I went, you know, decades later to be with Don Johansson at the site or to be with Tim White at the Art of, you know, to talk about Art of Pythagoras. No, that was one of the fringe benefits of doing the show, right? I mean, to, uh, to visit these great scientists, to see their amazing discoveries, you know, and, you know, you talk about a great discovery, Art of Pythagoras, it took 15 years for Tim and his team to really pull that out and put it all together. That was amazing. You know, and to hear him describe it, it's just such a privilege. Do you think that the discovery of the Denisovans in that cave and everything, or it's going to be yeah. you know, oh, gotcha. similarly spectacular or changing? Or yeah, or definitely. The Denisovans are, you know, that we know them mostly from their DNA, which is from the couple jaws and things. And it's really remarkable because discoveries like the Denisovans and a few others are showing that not too long ago, there were multiple kinds of humans on the planet. Think about that for a second, you know, and that wasn't so long ago. Um, hundred thousand years or so. And there are probably species and there are probably versions of humans we don't even know existed that, you know, that we'll, we'll discover more. So discoveries like that kind of show us what we need to do, you know, uh, what, what, we, what more we need to discover. There's just so much to discover about the world. And the Denisovan one's a huge one, you know. Going forward into ecology, um, 
you know, a lot of times in biology, we take, you know, one unit and then it's over and we start a new unit and everything. But what do you need to know as an evolutionary biologist about ecology? Like how do those two fields kind of work together? Very much so. So like in, the, in evolution, in paleontology, I should say, what we're looking at is how ecosystems are constructed. Like we look out on land today and you see trees, you see bugs, you see mice, you see birds, but you transport 500 million years ago, none of it was there. There were no ecosystems on land of multicellular animals, no multicellular creatures. Think about that. So the ecosystems we study have been constructed, have themselves evolved and arisen over time. So when we think about terrestrial ecosystems, you know, first came the plants invaded land, then came invertebrates, and then our distant relatives, the fish invaded land sequentially. So what you can study with in, in terms of ecology is how those ecosystems came about over time, because they weren't always here, you know? And that's the one thing when you're studying ecology now, you just take for granted, oh yeah, this ecosystem, here it is, you know, and here's how it functions. But no, it has an origin story too. And that's what we can do in, in paleontology. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. That is about all for the questions that I have for you, which puts us right at a half hour. Awesome. Um, does anybody in the chat have any additional questions that they'd like answered? I You're don't welcome. like a bunch of chat, just chatter, uh, but I don't know if anybody has anything else they want to type. Um, uh, um, <laughs> Caleb? Um, so yeah. are fish um, related to any non-vertebrates? Yeah, so if you look sort of lower in the tree, the closest, you're welcome, um, the closest in the tree are non-vertebrate chordates. So the closest relatives to fish that don't have backbones are little worm-like creatures called uh, amphioxus, another one called tunicates or urochordates. What they have is they have a dorsal nerve cord, they have a connective tissue rod called a notochord, and they have pharyngeal gill slits. And those gills that you know what they do in us, right? So yeah, there are worm-like creatures that have versions of the fish body plan already. And we see them in the fossil record in rocks about 500 million years old. And we also see them in comparative anatomy. There are a few creatures that are actually alive today that look something like them. So um, in some ways, um, those worms evolved into fish at some point, very slowly. Yeah, about 500 year, million years ago. So basically what you have is those fish have essentially a vertebrate body plan without skeletons. And so the next big step is skeletons came about. So they mineralized it. And the evidence seems to suggest that some of the genes that allow, that make skeletons already existed doing something else in those worm-like creatures. They were making that collagen and connective tissue. So that's another example of the repurposing, like those genes existed right. for collagen and stuff like that. And just right, kind exactly. of all changes. All exactly. right. Anybody else have any questions? Thank you, Caleb. Yeah, thanks, great questions. I think that might be about it. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Schumann. Oh, my pleasure. It. You guys are great, Wonderful. what a wonderful set of questions. Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, hope of applause. Good job, <laughs> loved it. Thanks, thanks, <laughs> thanks guys. All right, have a wonderful hope you, day. Okay, hope you and yours can stay healthy. Take care, bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Thanks, Bye, guys. Urban. I'll see you later. See you. That was so fun. I hope you that. liked it. It was so fun. <laughs> I'm glad you guys came. Thank you so much for showing up. Appreciate it. <laughs> I recorded it. I'll post the recording, okay? All right. <laughs> Bye, Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks. Bye.